Welcome to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson, your host. Religious revival. What is it and how do we know it's true? This is a question before us right now as we see what's happening at Asbury College. After a chapel service a few weeks ago, revival broke out. But some are questioning whether it's a true move of God. Joining us on the program to talk further about this is Dr. Tim Booker, President on a uh, professor, <laughs> not you're not a president on revivals. I was about to say that you are a professor uh, at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Booker, welcome to the Commonwealth Matters. Thank you. And uh, no, I am not president of Southern Seminary. Dr. Muller still holds that title. He does, and he would not be happy if uh, if he heard that faux pas from me. I know him personally, and I think he'd forgive me, though. If uh, I do as well. Understand. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Booker, you come uh, at this topic from a very interesting perspective. You wrote your THM thesis on the 1970 Asbury Revival and specifically how it impacted Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary. And you were also uh, one of two faculty members present um, at the revival services at Wheaton College in 1995, or maybe more specifically, you were present at all of the revival services at Wheaton College in 1995. So you have some firsthand experience with revivals. Before we go uh, down that line too much further, I want to talk about definitions. Um, how do you how do you define revival? Is the first question, and then secondly, how does that differ from an awakening? So, so how do you define a revival? Great questions. I'm convinced you could put 100 people in a room and ask them to define revival. Probably come up with 200 different definitions. Uh, I make a distinction between three different things that however people choose to call them. Uh, I use the term renewal when God works in the heart of a single believer. And, and that is something that can and should be the experience of every believer every day. Thinking about Romans 12, 1 and 2, about putting ourselves on the altar as a living sacrifice, having our minds renewed by the word of God. It's a reminder of the old adage, if you are not as close to God today as you were yesterday, guess who moved? So I, I use renewal for a single individual. Revival is when God moves in a special way in a community of believers. That community could be a marriage, a family, a small group, a church, or as we've seen, a college campus. I use the term awakening to describe when that movement of God spills out into the broader culture. Okay. Uh, here's a quick way to, to summarize it. If a revival happens, everyone in the church will know it. If a spiritual awakening happens, everyone in the community will know it. Most people use those three terms as synonymous, revival, renewal, spiritual awakening. Whatever terms we use, I think there are three distinct things that we can talk about. That's good. I had uh, had a chance to talk with the president of the seminary at Asbury, uh, Dr. Tim Tennant, and it was interesting. Uh, one of the things he noticed or noted to me is that he was reluctant to call it a revival in his terminology. His definition is that a revival is known by its fruits, and he said that they will not know the fruits until months or even years down uh, down the line. Um, they are calling it some an awakening is what his terminology is. Right. And and that that terminology would be almost opposite of what what I use. And uh, I know Tim Tennant, a uh, very wise, gifted leader. Uh, I agree that ultimately we will not know the fruit until years down the road. But I don't think that that means that we can't make some preliminary judgments on what we're seeing and on some of the immediate fruit. Uh, for example, when someone in my church makes a credible profession of faith, I don't wait 25 years to baptize them until I'm absolutely certain that the fruit is good. I, based on a credible profession of faith, I say, yes, I, I believe you are a genuine believer. In obedience to our Lord, we're going to baptize you. Yeah, that's good. I, I remember listening to a talk that Francis Schaeffer uh, gave years ago about awakening. I wasn't there in purpose in person. I was uh, he passed away before I even knew who he was. 
But Schaefer said there are three elements to an awakening. One is that the people, and this is the Nelson condensed version, by the way. What I recall right. him saying is that that uh, those in the church get right with God. Those who might become um, lukewarm or lost that first love of they had with Jesus, they get right with God. The second thing that happens is the lost get saved. Those who are outside of the church come under conviction, they confess Christ, and they get plugged into church. But the third thing that Schaefer said in every true awakening is that society and its morals uh, ultimately change as well. Would you agree with that? I would, and that's where using the term awakening, that, that third component, we don't always see. Uh, I've been studying revivals and spiritual awakening for over four decades. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the unanswered questions that I still have is, why does not every genuine revival become a spiritual awakening? Yeah. As I've studied, there are revivals that deeply impacted the church or a campus community, and those lives are still changed today, but it didn't spill over into the broader community as it did, for example, in what we know as the First Great Awakening. Yeah. So let's talk about that First Great Awakening. Um, you referenced Jonathan Edwards on a Facebook post, and Jonathan Edwards used uh, use the phrase, in the main, um, in talking about revival. So what, what does that mean, by the way, when you when you say in the main? Yeah, in the main, or what's at the heart of it, what is central? Edwards was <clears throat> fighting a battle on two fronts as he was trying to articulate what he believed God was doing during the First Great Awakening. On the one hand were the rationalists led by Charles Chauncey, who said all of this emotion present proves it's not a work of God. When God works, it's uh, everything is done decently and in order. Then you had those on the other side that said all this emotion proves it is a work of God. So Edwards talked about five distinguishing marks, which I can unpack in a moment. But yeah. but his, his uh, key was you don't look on the fringes, because when you look on the fringes, there's always going to be excess. And, and that's true for two primary reasons. First, you have some uh, oftentimes young, overly zealous, not yet mature, not yet completely sanctified people saying and doing stupid things. Yeah. And second, you have satanic opposition. So mm. Edward said, when revival comes, just expect there to be chaos on the fringes because Satan will seek to come in and sow tears. So he said, don't look at the excesses on the fringes. Look at the heart. Look at the center. He used the phrase in the main. Okay, that's good. Um, so what are some marks of a true revival? What are some things that we should look for if we're, if we're assessing Asbury? And I, I think it's important to note too, Tim, that we ought to be careful uh, as we assess this and be in and be use discernment, but to be careful uh, um, and reluctant to call something without us fully knowing. And the reason I'm saying that is because there is cynicism. There are people, if you get on social media, Twitter and Facebook, and they're saying this is this is not a true revival. I think we ought to be careful. Uh, and and uh, but what are some of the things that we should look for? Marks of a true revival. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Edwards in 1741 wrote one of his many books. It was called Distinguishing Marks of the Work of the Spirit of God. And Edwards, as he did an exegetical study of the book of 1 John, said there will be five things present whenever God is truly at work. And he applied this to revival. Uh, the first evidence that Edwards noted was that Jesus will be esteemed. Uh, we could say it in this way, Jesus will be in the spotlight. The Holy Spirit, according to John 15, 26, his job is to bear witness to Christ, not to call attention to himself. So if there is truly a Holy Spirit revival, Jesus will be in the spotlight. He will be in the center. Yet you can imagine a spotlight operator in a, in a play. His job is to shine the spotlight on the main character when he comes out on the stage. It, it would be crazy for that spotlight operator to turn that spotlight around and shine it on himself. So Edward said it, the first mark when the spirit of God is at work, you're going to see Jesus lifted up. Christ is going to be in the spotlight. 
So what are the second, what are some more marks that you will, that you will uh, the see? The second mark is that Satan's kingdom genuinely suffers. There, there won't simply be recognition of sin and confession of sin. There will be genuine repentance. And, and as I noted, I, I think that's one of the key marks because you can have an emotional feeling and, and feel convicted over something, but simply be sorry about the sin and, and have no desire uh, to get as far away from it as you can. So in true revival, there will be genuine repentance from sin. So Jesus is esteemed. There's true repentance of sin. What's the third mark of a true revival? Uh, men and women will have a greater response to scripture, a greater hunger for the word of God. And if we think about it, that makes sense because the same Holy Spirit who inspired the scriptures is the one bringing revival. It, it makes sense that those two things would be tied. All right. And the fourth Fourth is that men and women will have greater spiritual discernment, that they'll be able to more clearly discern between truth and error. And then the fifth is that there will be a greater love for God and for man. Mm -hmm. uh, Edwards acknowledged that's rather subjective, and yet he believed that would be a true mark of genuine revival. Very good. Now, Tim, you had uh, you had a chance to go to Asbury and observe what was going on. Did you see these elements, at least some of these elements reflected where there was an esteeming of Jesus Christ? You saw, did you see repentance, a greater hunger for the word, a greater hunger to, to, uh, uh, to be in fellowship with God? Did you see these things? I did. I, I was there for one Monday afternoon. And again, this went on for over two weeks. I was there just one small window of time. But uh, I went in specifically looking for these marks. And it was very clear to me Christ was being lifted up. He was being worshipped. He was being testified about. Uh, it was very clear there was repentance. People confessed sin that they had been convicted about and 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 wanted to get it as far away from their life uh, as they could. There seemed to be a response to Scripture. There, there was not a sermon during the time that I were there. There were sort of many sermonettes uh, teaching from Scripture and then application. Uh, so th those were marks that I definitely witnessed in in the brief time that I was there. Tim, one of the criticisms that I heard uh, that this was not a true revival was because there was no preaching, no uh, design of having a, a central role for preaching. Of course, this uh, revival, just to remind our listeners, uh, this happened from a chapel service, student-led worship service in chapel, regularly scheduled chapel program, where these students ended up staying afterwards. They The, the worship team continued to play uh, instead of moving on to the next class or whatever else they had to do, they stayed and they worshiped. And that worship um, poured on throughout the afternoon. It continued into the evening and really around the clock for about two weeks straight. I'm not sure if it's still going on now, but I want to go to the one of the criticisms I heard that there was no um, preaching that was involved, at least in the early stages of the revival. How would you respond to that? Yeah, I I, I think that is true. There, there, It wasn't a preaching-centered event. There, there were sermons, as I understand, at different points, but, but, but perhaps not initially. Uh, James Burns, uh, over 100 years ago, wrote a book, Revivals, Their Laws and Their Leaders. And, and one of the, what he called laws, I would call principles of revival, mm -hmm. is that a variety no, no two of them look exactly the same. And mm. certainly as we look at the first great awakening, that was fueled by the preaching of God's word, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and others. But think about the 1857-58 prayer awakening. It's called the prayer awakening or the layman's prayer awakening because that was where the focus was. Uh, it was on uh, prayer as opposed to preaching. In fact, there were signs put up, don't as you pray, don't even pray more than five minutes. We want more people to have the opportunity to be able to participate. In Wales in 1904, uh, the, the movement of revival was really carried through singing uh, more so than preaching. Now, that doesn't mean the word wasn't present. I, I think that's a key distinction. The word can be present even though it's not a full-fledged expository sermon. Scripture is being shared throughout. People are being challenged by the Word of God, just not in the uh, traditional preaching format. 
Yeah, very good. If you're just joining us, you're listening to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson, Executive Director of the Commonwealth Policy Center, talking with Dr. Tim Booker of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. We're talking revival. We need to take a, a quick break. Uh, so stay with us and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Commonwealth Matters. Richard Nelson here with Dr. Tim Booker of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And we're talking about the revival at Asbury College. And Dr. Booker, just before the break, uh, you referenced the, a couple of different um, awakenings slash revivals. Um, I want to go back to the first great awakening with Jonathan Edwards. That was considered uh, a genuine move of God. And you saw it not just with conviction of sin and really changed lives, but it was widespread throughout the New England colonies uh, and, and even past that, I believe. Um, uh, but Edwards was known for his um, deep sermons. I'm thinking of the of the sermon that he gave sinners in the hands of an angry God, which I understand that he just read that. It was read. And yet, uh, if historical accounts are true, there were people who were wailing and weeping and holding on to the furniture there in the church for fear of being sucked into hell. Is that how you understand it? And then I've got a follow-up yes, question. That, that is true. And, you know, I, I think one small caveat to that, uh, People say, you know, Edwards just sort of read that in a monotone voice, et cetera, et cetera. I, he did read his sermons. He manuscripted them. But I don't believe for a second he read it in a non-passionate monotone voice. I, I believe he he uh, preached that sermon with feeling. Yeah, I think so. If you've read that, and it's been years since I've taken a look at it. Uh, but it is it's written uh, in a very descriptive way, very biblically grounded, and I'd have a hard time imagining anybody could just read it without being moved, without being passionate as they as they share that. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because I want to tie into what I said before the break that uh, one of the criticisms is that uh, there had this. Uh, revival at Asbury did not start with preaching. It was centered around worship. Um, it, it, but to your point, uh, you did mention that there are different variations, different um, the revivals look differently. Um, what can we look at biblically, I guess, for to your point that it doesn't take preaching, and I don't want to belabor that point, but could you point to other scriptural principles or scriptural passages that would speak to revivals um, looking a little differently and not being a uniform um, way across the board, if you will. Can you point to some biblical passages? Yeah, if, if we think about, you know, revival, and, and we see this throughout the Old Testament, we, we repeatedly read a three-word phrase about the children of Israel, and they forgot and they forgot. And, and many times God would bring judgment upon them through a foreign army, through famine. People would repent, would cry out to God. There, there'd be a time of refreshing. Uh, in some of those, it, uh, it, it certainly centered around preaching. Think about Nehemiah chapter 8 as the word of God was rediscovered and, and preaching took place and the people came under conviction and cried out to God. Uh, so I think as we look throughout the Old Testament, we see several instances of when the people had strayed away from God, God brought conviction. There was repentance to one degree or another that that involved then a, a return to a deeper relationship with God. Yeah, that's good. Um, so the Second Great Awakening has roots here in Kentucky. It goes back to the Red River Meeting House in Logan County, Kentucky, moved on to Cane Ridge, not far from our office here in Frankfurt. That was in Bourbon County. Um, how would you categorize that revival? That, uh, the way I, well, go ahead. I want to hear from you. How would you categorize that? Well, the, the Second Great Awakening, uh, beginning right around 1800, a few signs of it prior to 1800, and, and really continuing into the 1830s or 1840s, a longer period of time, I think it's helpful when you look at the Second Great Awakening to look at it in, in sort of two different phases. 
we, you, you mentioned Cane Ridge and other uh, camp meetings that were taking place on the frontier. People would come together, hear preaching, many people converted. Uh, revival was also happening on the Eastern seaboard. Uh, among many of the colleges and, and universities there, uh, campus revivals taking place there that did a deep work in the lives of students and saw many students converted. Yeah, that's good. Um, so um, how, as believers, should we desire revival? Softball question to you. <laughs> uh, we should desire that close relationship with the Lord. Uh, we live in a world that constantly tempts us to look elsewhere for our fulfillment. Uh, it is easy to set up idols. Calvin said that our heart is an idol making factory. And so we, we constantly need to be exposed to the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to apply that to our hearts and to our lives. So, how do we desire revival as followers of Jesus without manufacturing it, if you will? Um, yeah, we, that, that's... You know, we're, we're prone, right? We're prone to um, force things. <laughs> we're prone to make God act in a certain way. Lord, we want, we need revival. Do it. And we can, I, I've been part of worship services and all transparency where I uh, have seen um, very lively worship, um, dynamic uh, worship leaders in a revival-like atmosphere manufactured, how can we guard ourselves against that? that? That is a great question. And it is an ever-present danger because of our American pragmatism. And, and we think we can uh, just whip all this up on our own. I love back in 1970 when Dennis Kinlaw, who was the president of Asbury College at the time, mm -hmm. was interviewed. And the, the reporter said, so something like this has happened at Asbury before. He said, yes, back in 1950. He said, so it's been 20 years. So did, did a group of you decide that it's been a while since we've had one of these? We, we need to have one again. And Dr. Kinlaw just laughed and said, we've been trying that every year since the last one. Mm. No, what happened this past week is we just opened up the chapel doors and it was as if God himself just walked in. Interesting story uh, about what preceded this revival at Asbury is uh, one of the administrators there told me that there was a, a, a young man from, I want to say Indonesia, somewhere in that part of the country anyway, who have, had been praying for revival on the campus of Asbury. He'd actually, he, he'd, I, I think, been a student there for a while and walked around buildings and walked around the campus, sometimes with placards on the front uh, and the, on the back, calling for students to repent and asking God to revive them. And just a couple months before the revival broke out, uh, he had left. He felt called to go back to his home country. But God put on his heart to come to return just before the revival happened. I find that fascinating that uh, this young man had been praying for revival. Is that an element, Tim, of revival? Is prayer, does prayer precede revival? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Armin Geswin, uh, who was a great prayer warrior of the past generation, wrote an article in a Canadian publication called The Prairie Overcomer. And the title of his article was, Every Revival is Really Two Revivals. Hmm. And his basic point was, the first revival is a revival of prayer, where God stirs the hearts of his people. And it is after that, then, that what we call revival uh, that takes place. So as, as one of the saints of old, Matthew Henry said, when God intends a great blessing for his people, the first thing he does is to set them a praying. That's good. That's good. Um, you referred in, in a social media post of yours um, to help us think through revival. You said that there are three groups present during a revival. Uh, tell us more about the, the those who are present there. Yeah, it was uh, actually the, the context I talked about there was a worship service because th this applies every single Sunday in each of our churches. Yeah. Uh, in Luke 7, we see that there was a sinful woman who was washing Jesus' feet with her tears, anointing them with uh, costly perfume, yeah. and the Pharisee present there was indignant. Yeah. And so I just noted that in every worship gathering, there are three groups present. First, the one being worship, which is the Lord. Second, the worshipers, 
those who are genuinely worshiping. But then the third group are the spectators. And how do we know if we're a spectator and not a worshiper? Well, because we're not worshiping ourselves, we're looking around and being critical at how others are worshiping without realizing we're not even worshiping ourselves. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Dr. Booker, we are running out of time, but I do, I want to squeeze a couple other questions in here. Are revivals exclusively a Methodist and holiness distinctive, which Wesleyans are affiliated with, with, uh, with that denomination, are, or are there other denominations involved with revivals? Well, again, it, it depends on how you define the term Southern Baptist. Many uh, churches have a fall and spring revival. It's not truly a, a revival. It's a, a special week set aside, oftentimes for evangelistic purposes. But we, we do see that revival has happened at Asbury in 1950, 1970, again, 2023, spreading to other campuses. But the 1995 revival actually began uh, at Howard Payne University, a Southern Baptist school in Texas. It spread from there to Wheaton and actually from Wheaton then to Asbury. And I understand that the Asbury revival is moving to other colleges across the Commonwealth of Kentucky and perhaps across the country. I think um, Cedarville, perhaps in Ohio. Are you aware of it spreading any further? Uh, I see different social media posts about uh, prayer taking place on other college campuses, both uh, religious and secular. Uh, so it, it appears like it is. And, and I think here's why. When we hear about a genuine work of God going on somewhere, those of us that have been praying for revival, uh, those of us who long for it, uh, we, we begin to pray, I think, with even greater boldness and with even greater faith. It appears like God may be uh, answering our prayers. And, and we need uh, we need God. We need the reality of God back in our culture. I, I uh, The listeners of this program know that Commonwealth Policy Center addresses the issues of the day from a biblical worldview. And the issues, Tim, seem to be getting uh, more serious uh, and more consequential than ever, whether it's um, public decency. You know, I think of the Grammys performance where the devil was lifted up and um, this idea that there are no moral boundaries when it comes to human sexuality. I think of what's happening with our young people, our children today in public schools, where they're um, pushed to embrace LGBT identities. Um, I think of other uh, immoralities that have become mainstream and normalized, if you will, in our culture. And here's the last question. Can God use a decadent culture to awaken his church? Absolutely. You, you see that throughout the Old Testament. Uh, we've all heard the old adage, there are no atheists in foxholes. That, that's not completely true. There are some people that become even more hardened under adversity. But throughout the scriptures, we see time and time again, God using adversity to drive his people to their knees, where they pray and ask God to do what only he can do. And God delights to answer those prayers. Amen. That's a good uh, good final word to close on. Uh, Dr. Booker, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you and keep up the good work. 